Hello, my name is Emma Sheva and I'm an author. My latest novel, How to Save the World with a Chicken and an Egg, is the story of Ivy Pink Floyd and Nathaniel Breakwell who care about the planet and its creatures and desperately want to make a difference. This, of course, coincides with Earth Day, which is celebrated every year on the 22nd of April. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about my book and about Earth Day and how those two things relate to each other. Um, this is me, <clears throat> excuse me, holding a copy of my book. Now, I know because as being an adult, it's very difficult to know what you can do to help make a difference. And because I'm a parent and a teacher, I know that young people often feel frustrated, angry and powerless. The planet is changing because every day we're changing it. But what can we do to make that change positive rather than negative? I decided to write this book because I love planet Earth. I love its countries and cultures, its landscapes, its people and its creatures. And I wanted children to know there is plenty they can do to be the kinds of citizens that planet Earth needs. The book is set in Southwold in Suffolk. This is a seaside town my uncle bought a house in when I was 11, just behind that, the, it was opposite the lighthouse, just behind that row of houses. We went there every half term and summer. I drove, we drove up there from South London where I grew up as a child and a teenager and I went everywhere all around on my bike from the pier one end to the harbour at the other and all around. Um, my mother, my uncles and my cousins moved up there permanently and I still visit every year, three times a year sometimes, with my children who are now grown up themselves. So this place is very much part of our family history. The story is about Ivy Pink Floyd who's an animal lover and she carries Dot, her Orpington hen, to the library to read her stories. Since Ivy was a child and her mind merged with an Indian runner duck, she's been able to understand animals, or at least she thinks she can. She knows that seagulls are good at making announcements and that they tell bad dad jokes. And she has a dog called Rufus, who is like her dad and goes everywhere with her. She meets Nathaniel, who after the death of his grandmother, goes to Southwold to stay with the mother he hasn't lived with since he was four. Nathaniel's mother's called Henny and she rescues animals, including Lola the macaw who lives in their house. Nathaniel loves facts. He's autistic and the way that he tries to make friends is by telling all these facts to people that he meets and he doesn't have much success. He tells them about Japanese spider crabs, which are the biggest crabs in the world. He also knows about exploding ants, about record-breaking cows and about hamster glands. He particularly loves saliva and mucus and mentions in the book the Aerodama swift, which is a tiny bird who lives in, ca who lives in, the, live in caves and whose saliva dries out and is made into bird's nest soup, one of the most expensive dishes in the world. If he could have a pet, Nathaniel would have an axolotl, which is on the right, um, a yeti, yeti crab or a, a sucker-footed bat, which I'll let you look up. Now, these, this is the Holston Frisian, which is the type of cow that is in the book, and I won't tell you what record-breaking thing this cow has done. Um, we also learn about hedgehogs and how they lose their spines all the time but never go bald. Nathaniel knows why. And we hear a sad story about Joey the hamster. But you do also know about why hamsters are called Mr. Saddlebags and where they're called that and why they have glands on the sides of their hips, the males anyway. <clears throat> now a large event happens in the book, which I'm not going to tell you, but this is a hint. This is the largest turtle on earth. It's a record breaker in many ways. It's the biggest, the heaviest, it swims the furthest, dives the deepest. They believe that leatherbacks have been around since the time of the dinosaurs and when you see one next to a human, which I'll let you look up as well, you'll see just how enormous these creatures are. Scientists think they have this soft shell because a heavy hard shell would be too difficult for them to swim and get out of the water because of their enormous size. So these are such incredible creatures and they're endangered like many of our incredible creatures. Their numbers are dwindling and we are in danger of losing one of the most ancient and incredible creatures in the world. But <clears throat> there are lots of good things. Um, things are changing. Some of the creatures, um, sorry, some of the turtles around the world are seeing numbers rise. Um, and I found out this really, really lovely piece of research and I wanted to share it with you. So researchers from Brazil, Mexico and America studied the nests of 12 leatherback sea turtles in Oaxaca in Mexico. 
Starting on day 51, which is the point at which the baby's ears should be developed enough to hear sound, they monitored the nests for any signs of noise, and they immediately began detecting sounds and recorded more than 300 different ones. They classified the sounds into four categories. There were chirps, there were grunts and complex hybrid, hybrid tones, and then there were two part sounds, pulse-like ones, and harmonic frequency bands, which I don't really know what that means. But this led the researchers to believe that the baby turtles coordinate their hatching time, especially because they emitted those latter sounds or those last two sets of sounds close to the time of the birth. This phenomenon has been observed in other animals ranging from birds to crocodiles, probably as a way of surviving. Because in the case of the turtles, if they hatch together, it increases their chance of survival. Predators like birds can only eat so many sea turtles at a time, meaning a few of the hatchlings will make it safely to the sea. Now, of course, there are other predators in the sea, but this is why turtles have a, lay a lot of eggs and have a lot of hatchlings. Now, we're changing the planet, as we know. We have so much plastic everywhere. We wrap fruit and vegetables in it. We have it on water bottles. We wrap, up, wrap our, plastic, our, our rubbish in it. Look where we throw it in beautiful places. There are landfills, there are beaches that have been destroyed. Where is it going to go? What do we do with it? So it ends up in, in the sea. But we also have a lot of chemical pollution. We have water pollution. Our planet is not really a healthy place for us or for creatures to live on at the moment. And it's not just the big creatures that are suffering. We need to make sure that we have wasps and that we don't splat them. <clears throat> Excuse me, you'll find out in the book why. We need to make sure that the waterways and the seas are clear and clean for us, for the birds and for the fish. And we also need to ensure that insects, even though there are millions of them, their numbers are dwindling. And we need them. This whole thing, the whole world balances on multiple ecosystems. And if any one of those was to fall down, we're in trouble. So... I've put together some resources and they're going to be on the Chicken House website if they're not already. There are three lots that I've done so far. One is a fun task and creative writing. For example, write the dialogue of a conversation between you and an animal. What would you talk about? What would they have to say? What bothers them? And what would they like humans to do for them? So that's just one of those tasks. There are probably about 10, I think. I've also put together a discussion guide. One of the questions is, do you know any un unusual animal facts? If not, see what you can find out and share your favourites with your friends or your class. And then I've also looked into why we need to save water, because I can't understand why we live on an island surrounded by water where it rains very often and why we need to turn off the tap. Why do we need to save water? So I looked into it and by doing that, I learned so much. So I put together a resource that links to the water cycle. It's got a quiz, it's got facts and it's got tips for saving water and what you could do to try and help. <clears throat> now, a little about Earth Day. Earth Day is celebrated every year, or honoured, let's say, on the 22nd of April. This is a big, big global movement to try and raise awareness of what we can do to help save the environment. It started in 1970 when a senator saw an oil spill and wanted to make a difference. He made it on the 22nd of April because it falls between spring break, which is when American college students have time off, and their final exams because he wanted them to get involved. But since then, it's become a global phenomenon. People all over the world get involved and do things for Earth Day. If you look at the map um, on the Earth Day website, there's an interactive map of the world and you can click on a number of dots in countries all over the world. There's different colored dots for different events. So there's film screenings, there's talks in lots of different languages. There's conferences in Cambodia. A teacher is taking a class out for a, a walk in the woods. In Thailand, there are events going on. There's a bake sale and everyone's wearing green and blue in a school. Um, a teacher in, Cam in Cameroon said that there's very little uh, uh, environmental awareness or education there. So he's taking children out into the playground to te talk to them about what's going on and what they can do. So all over the place, there are things going on and you could hold an event, wear blue and green, something quite simple, try and raise some money in a bake sale, do something to get involved and register your event and it will go on the interactive map. Now, a book can't save the world and two individuals like Ivy, 
who's been fostered and finds it difficult to be friends with humans. And Nathaniel, who's on the autism spectrum, and because of that finds it difficult to interact socially with people. They need to come together to try and do something to make a difference. And this is the message, really. No one can do it on their own. We need to work together to make a difference. So if you could, this Earth Day, do one thing that will help. Maybe do something with water in your house. Maybe buy fruit and vegetables without packaging. Maybe think about the consumption and the things that you buy. Maybe try and raise money for uh, a, an environmental organisation. Clean up a street. We went down to the beach the other day. I live in Brighton. And we took some plastic, picked up things. Um, we put rubber gloves on and we took a black bag. There's lots of things that you can do, small things, that will make a difference. If we all do something, it will make positive change. So even though the book is about climate change and autism and it, it's a, there's a lot of creature facts, the bottom line is that it's about Ivy and Nathaniel, an 11-year-old girl and a 12-year-old boy who desperately want to make a difference and want their actions to be positive. And this Earth Day, I want to celebrate that the fact that people do care and the fact that people do want to make a difference and to offer to you the suggestion that you read the book, that you learn about what you can do and that you pick one thing that you do every day to try and make a difference just until maybe we all become much more aware of what we can do in a much bigger way to make a difference. So happy Earth Day and thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy my novel.